This is Justin, I'm Riri, and welcome to the Anthology Sessions. For the next few days, we will be sitting down with architects, designers, and educators in a short exchange of ideas about architecture and our cities. We are inviting everyone to join in on the live questions. We're going to answer them on the spot and everything. So for our first guest today, Justin, please introduce him. Uh, he graduated from National University of Singapore with a degree in urban design. Uh, He's a principal architect of WTA uh, Architecture Design Studio, and he's the festival founder of Anthology. So here we welcome architect William T. Hi, everyone. Our, our live studio audience. So here to talk about social architecture and the emergency quarantine facilities and Horizon Manila Master Plan. Again, we'd like everyone to ask questions throughout the session and we'll answer them on the spot. So first, let's talk about social architecture. Yeah, so you know, our office has always been focused about advocating for social architecture. Um, we really believe that architecture must go beyond you know, just building structures um, and finding spaces for everyone. But rather, we have to adapt a social aspect you know, to everything that we do, especially in mega cities like Metro Manila, where we are seeing you know, um, densities that have never been seen before. Um, we feel like architecture must adapt this aspect where it tries to connect everyone. Um, that architecture is, you know, kind of like the keystone in terms of how we build our communities. Um, architecture really is what makes up our city. It's what makes our built environment. And every piece of architecture must contribute to the city. So we look at, you know, planning not just as a master plan. We look at it as like every individual building counts and especially social infrastructure, because that's what really brings us all together. Okay, so yeah, like you said, social architecture has always been almost like a bedrock of the office's work. And I think throughout the years, it has been a constant, uh, like a factor to all our designs. But also, it's also been constantly changing through all our projects. Um, what's interesting this year was that we have two very different uh, projects at different scales. We have a horizon, which is a, master plan and we have our quarantine facilities which is a sm almost as small as a house and it's interesting how our arch social architecture her philosophy kind of lives on in these two different at two ends of the yeah. spectrum so what we're trying to reimagine is that you know um, it's not about individual buildings or like how big a building is you know whether it's a piece of public infrastructure whether it's an institutional building or even a private house we feel like you know every Typology, you know, um, can actually help bring us all together. Even residences, you know, um, for example, like what we're trying to do here with Twelve Locks, you know, um, we're trying to change, you know, the landscape of Little Baguio and San Juan, and we're trying to, you know, remove, you know, um, fences, you know, um, these long lines of fences on the ground plane. We're trying to keep, you know, the ground plane alive. We're trying to build ground activity. And we feel like this is a good alternative. So you know, it, it's not really the typology per se or the scale of the project. Um, we feel like any form of architecture must take on a social aspect. Okay, we have these models in front of us now, and I guess we can talk about how we showed social architecture through these projects. Let's start with the smallest one, which would be the Saint Scholastica Church. Yeah. So this project um, is in northern Samar. And when we're looking at this project, when you first arrive there, um, it's a very small fishing village. So all you see are, you know, um, these traditional Nipah huts in the area. And we were thinking, how do you build in context? You know, we always try to observe context and intent in terms of what we do. And we thought to ourselves, you know, these roof structures are pretty interesting. So what if we just build the roof itself and remove all the walls? And so this is what it came about. And it's kind of like this, geometric interpretation of the typical roof structure that you will find there and so what happens is that you know you see all these uh, materials they're ma made of amakan um, this chapel was actually built by three persons and so the idea really is that it's made of local materials um, it's something that you know the local community can build and so you know even the stained glass you know um, that was done locally and we feel like you know, um, if we are to build a chapel or a church, it must always be open. 
And so if you can see, you can actually look through this model and it's open 24 seven to everyone. And then I think the location of this chapel being in the courtyard you know, of a missionary hospital really serves it well. Because you know, in times of trouble, in times of pressure and need, the church must always be open to every one of us. And so we feel like this is a place of solace. It gives shelter and you know, shade to everyone in the community. Oh, so first of all, three, only three people in sight then? Yeah. Actually, three people started this project and one of them passed away. So two people actually finished this project. And so it took them a while, but you know, they managed to finish it, you know, just the two of them. But that's an interesting and not, not so common scenario. Yeah. <laughs> I guess that this building was done by three people. So, but um, our social architecture in that sense is a little different because uh, more often than not, we deal with a lot of density, a lot of things that are working on the city. But in this sense, it's more contextual and more like caters yeah. to like, like you said, um, it's in the middle of a hospital and it caters to the people who are in need. And I think that's a different. So the thing we always try to, you know, um, try to do with social architecture is we try to make, um, we try to create social intimacy by building hyper-local spaces, you know, uh, spaces that belong to the community. And so, you know, that's why we built this chapel because it kind of like serves the, you know, that fishing village particularly. You know, and then the other idea is about building barrier-free spaces, opening spaces up. Because um, often, you know, architecture actually discriminates against so many people. So this project, um, and we know another project that displays social architecture would be the bookstop, which is probably the first one. So these are of similar scale. And then we have a bigger project, like this bridge. And so how do you say that the social architecture translate, even though the scale now is getting bigger? Um, I think when we were tasked to do this project, it was really you know, going you know, uh, out of our comfort zone. You know, um, and we felt like, yes, architecture must contribute more to the social infrastructure that we're building. You know, very often bridges are seen as the purvey of engineers. And so for us really, you know, um, if you insert architects into bridge building, what happens then, right? So, I mean, we really wanted to get this project built. It's currently under construction. The girders are up now if you go to the site. Um, this is actually in, along the Pasig River. It's in Quiapo. Um, it connects Ermita with Quiapo. And, you know, the, the reality is that Metro Manila is bisected by the Pasig River. We founded this city on the banks of the Pasig River, and yet there is not a single pedestrian bridge that crosses the Pasig River. So this will be the first pedestrian crossing, you know, uh, exclusively pedestrian crossing along the Pasig River. And so when we were doing this, the idea really was, you know, um, how do we get people to start crossing pedestrian bridges? We might have forgotten this because, you know, uh, we've never built one. And so we said, you know, actually a bridge is not just a crossing point, it's actually a hub because it connects two communities, you know, and it brings them together. So it becomes a centrality. And for us, you know, how you make this into a centrality is by inserting program into this project. And so it's not just a bridge. We wanted to insert spaces for um, buskers, for vendors. Um, we wanted people to be able to hang out here, you know, just to make them appreciate the Pasig River much more, you know, and have them, you know, kind of like a more intimate relationship with the river and also enjoy the view that, you know, basically none of us in the city, you know, have. And so it's really something that we want to change. Uh, we want to encourage pedestrian mobility. Um, you know, one of the low-lying fruits in terms of like solving our traffic problems is to encourage pedestrianization. And so we wanted people to be able to travel from Ermita to Quiapo and vice versa without taking a jeepney, without driving their cars. It's a great space. You know, if you're a tourist, you want to enjoy, you want to see Quiapo, you want to see Ermita, you can cross this bridge. And so we want to encourage that. And by do, how we do so is by inserting events and programs. And this is something we learned with the Bookstop project, that for social architecture to work, you must insert programming into it. Because architecture is not just about a structure. It's also about the interaction of people. And so we actually had a schedule, like we did a year schedule of events for when this bridge opens, um, how we can get people you know, to come here more often. I think that's a misinterpretation of what an architecture, what architecture means for a, for a project or for a city. Is that when you say an architect is in charge of a, bit of a bridge, you often think it's a form or what it looks like. But I think that's not the case here. 
like it's almost they can almost say it's just a it's a line it's basically yeah. a line and but how do you see the scale up and how do you see this like change the future of the city and how a city grows and how, how manila grows specifically yeah i think one of the things we were looking for when we were designing this of course at first we had all these architect architects ideas about making it fantastic and all that i mean it's a bridge it's a nice bridge it's on the river the view is fantastic you can take great photos of it but then we felt like you know being a pedestrian bridge you know there must be a certain sense of humility in the structure and of course being you know in the heart of manila you know with iconic structures around it we wanted it to be as simple as possible and so it is a more human bridge you know especially when seen against the backdrop of let's say the ayala bridge or the Quezon bridge you know the scale is more human um it's something that you know people can understand it it's almost something like everyone can build so that's really what we wanted it to feel like when we were building this bridge. Is this bridge supposed to encourage more pedestrian bridges? Do you think that's something that we want to see in the city? Is that going to change a lot? That's really the main goal we have. That's why we're kind of like actively um, going to be involved in terms of like the programming and how to operate the bridge. Because we feel like if we can make this one bridge work, there is there are so many opportunities for us to build more crossings across the Pasig River. I think, you know, shout out to you know, every mayor in every yeah. city, you know, every city planning official here. Um, or, you know, everyone in our community, you know, we should encourage or, you know, demand, you know, for pedestrian crossings. Um, a very small percentage of Filipinos actually own cars, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we should push for something that is more inclusive, that's more for everyone. And hopefully, actually, hopefully you can have bike lanes, bike bridges, and all that. Um, this bridge is actually designed to accommodate uh, cycling. Um, you know, it's just a matter of like trying to talk to the surrounding structures, whether we can integrate, you know, a bicycle ramp to go up the bridge. Um, but if you can see the division of this bridge, you know, this one side actually is a cycling lane. So this one side is the pedestrian lane. So it's actually meant to be able to adapt whenever, when we get the you know, approvals for a cycling ramp here and a cycling ramp here. I think this side you know, um, is pretty easy because this is the Pasig River Esplanade and it's a public space. So now it's a matter of convincing this, the owners of Kinta Market actually in this side of the bridge and how we can get them to allow us to build a cycling lane. It's good to involve to call, shout out at the mayor because yeah. <laughs> we see the pedestrian crossings in the city of just crosswalks over the streets. Yeah. So this is like a bigger scale one. Yeah, I mean, if we are building, yeah. you know, so many overpasses across streets, <laughs> why can't we build one across our river that, you know, divides all of us? And has more meaning in it. Oh, again, uh, this is your chance to ask Will for your questions or if you have any thoughts or ideas. But I think this also in a way translates to not just architects, but it's a form of activism for your, and just basically caring about your city. I think that's something that we can all take away from this. I think that's why we have anthology, right? Um, I mean, we really want all architects to be advocates for our community. Um, so especially, I think this year's theme, Our City, is so apt. Because, you know, in times like these, that's what we need, you know. Um, each architect can actually be an advocate for our city and our built environment. We talk so much about advocating for our natural environment, for nature, which we care about. But we should also care about, you know, this built environment that we're living in. Um, you know, I've just been building a fish pond outside and I was thinking like, you know, we are all like fishes right now, right? We are kind of like trapped in this fish bowl that is Manila. And so we should really figure out how we can make, you know, this space better or this city better. How can we make our urban environment better? What are the urban amenities that we need, right? Especially now that we cannot travel, we cannot go somewhere else to see different buildings and different spaces. Um, where's your library? Where's your museum? How do we access these spaces? Are they available for each and every one of us? That's really the question we should all be asking, not just each and every one of us, not just of our government, but everyone with the means to do so. And we have another project here that you wanted to highlight, the stadium. Can you bring it up? Right here. I don't know if a lot of people are familiar with this project yet. So this project um, is a stadium we're building in Lawag, in Ilocos Norte. So when we were first tasked to build this stadium, 
I mean, the idea really is that I always feel like, you know, we Filipinos, we don't play football, uh, we don't play baseball so much. Um, so a lot of our stadiums, they almost become like white elephants, right? Um, they get used maybe once or twice a year. They're prepared for the Palarong Pambansa. But then the question is, then what, right? And so when we were looking at this and really trying to come up with an idea and, you know, it was not really something fantastic that we wanted to build about the form and anything, but we wanted to build something fantastic and incredible for the people of Lawag. So this stadium is actually um, situated just north of the park and north of the park and west of the university. And so we felt like it's a chance to connect this, you know, um, actually by opening up this stadium. So I was just kind of like drawing the section of this stadium. And I said like, you know, that section actually is what I wanted the stadium to look like. And so we kind of like just opened, you know, the southern side of the stadium. So if you can see it, you can actually walk from the park and cross into the stadium. Now the stadium itself basically doubles the park space that's available in this neighborhood. And then there was a street here, which we removed. So now this promenade connects the stadium with the university. Now the entirety of the sides of the stadium, if you can see these arches here, is open. So the stadium is basically open to the university students. They can come out, come it's in here. It's, yeah, it's porous, right? And so again, you know, like I said, I think architecture kind of discriminates against so many people, right? Um, if you have to imagine our public spaces, especially now, we have to go through security, we have to go through fences and gates, we have to be registered. But most importantly, I think a lot of our buildings, for you to be able to enter our public buildings, you have to be dressed properly, right? So you have to have the proper attire, at least you have to have shoes and all that. But, you know, in a sense, I think, architecture especially public architecture must be accessible to, to the people who need it the most right people who cannot afford to buy books must be able to go inside libraries people who cannot afford to go to the gym must have access to the stadium or sports ground and so we wanted architecture that's open 24 7 um, open to everyone um, oftentimes architecture or architects we always talk about accessibility and yet a lot of our structures are not accessible to a big swath of our population. You know, um, our public infrastructure is not accessible to people who don't have maybe IDs or proper identification. We don't have a national identification card. So, you know, we don't, so if you cannot register, then you don't have an ID. Sometimes you cannot enter. If you're not dressed properly, you're not, you cannot enter. And also it discriminates against people who don't have the time. You know, with the traffic, with the crazy traffic we have in our city, it takes an hour or two to go to our public spaces. And so by making spaces more local, more accessible, then you're allowing access, not just to people who don't have the means, but also the people who don't have the time. And so that's really the idea behind building barrier-free local spaces that connect with the immediate neighborhood. This, the location of the stadium is excellent because you can imagine children playing in the playground, playing their football or whatever. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, then, it's just making the stadium available to everyone, yeah, right? So imagine being having access to kind of like, you know, this facility every day, you know, where you don't have to register in advance, where you don't have to be part of the uh, varsity team, if you may, or anything like that, right? I mean, everyone can come in. And that's really, you know, this idea, I think, I think it goes back to my childhood. You know, I grew up in Tondo and, you know, being able to play basketball on the streets, you know, the street ball culture of the Philippines, I think. That's really something I treasure, you know, because that's how you meet your neighbors. You know, you get to know the guys you play with. Um, you come from all sorts of different backgrounds. And so I feel like, you know, sports space, you know, um, street ball culture must be something that we preserve. And so we want to keep opening up, you know, um, spaces like these to the public. I think it's, a, it's just a, like almost like a problem that we didn't know existed in the Philippines. Because if you think about it, how often have you been to a arena and I think it's to some extent you it, it's an it's an experience to walk in and see everything and you know, it's a shame that not everybody's had an experience. Yeah, I think every one of us who used to play basketball weekly yeah. like us in our office we used to um you have to reserve the yeah. the basketball court um so you know all of these things right I think it would kind of be nice to just be able to show up you know and just play ball 
And so that's the street ball culture that we're kind of missing now. And especially, you know, now with the pandemic and maybe the new normal, we need more open spaces. And so open courts really are something that we should preserve and we should try to find more of in our city. Um, I think we should ask for some help to get this model out and then we can talk about Horizon Manila. But yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So we'll talk about these two projects. So in COVID-19 last year, this time last year, we had Anthology and that was the last main event that we got. I think most of us got to attend before all of the lockdowns happened. Yeah, and I'm really missing Intramuros, actually. I know. And so during that time, we created the Anthology Pavilion. So we had all of the pavilions for the architects. And then we created the Anthology Pavilion. And eventually, this evolved into what turned into the emergency quarantine facilities. So tell us about that journey that we were with you on. <laughs> yeah, so I think last Anthology, um, who, everyone who was there um, saw this pavilion. Uh, the main idea behind this pavilion back then was being able to kind of like build something without very rigorous or very um, detailed plans, you know. We, I feel like it's always, you know, all the technology we're trying to explore, it's always about taking the architects, you know, out of architecture, making it, you know, um, easier, making it smoother, right? Um, but I felt like, you know, maybe, you know, um, when the time comes that everything becomes more and more automated, um, it's actually, so what is the role of an architect if all the documentation is, can be done you know, um, by better and better computers? Um, where is the hand of the architect in each project? And so we wanted to explore something where we can draw a simple plan, you know, elevations and all that, and simply just build it and make it happen. Um, that's really the gist behind this project about how quickly we can do architecture and how we can do architecture that's adaptive on site. And so when we were building this structure, we were looking at using, you know, easily available materials, right? And materials that everyone can manipulate, materials that are flexible, that, you know, um, that you can easily correct, if you may. And so with that, you know, when the pandemic hit, you know, everyone was kind of like faced with this dilemma. I think a year ago, everyone was kind of like, we were more uneasy and unsure about, you know, the the COVID-19 yeah, and how long it was going to take. Um, of course, we all hoped it was going to be a month or two, right? Two weeks, I think, was yeah, our first impression. That's two weeks and all that. <laughs> um, we said if everyone quarantined for two weeks, it would be good, right? And then I think around a year ago, I think the week of March 24th, exactly a year ago, we started getting you know all these um, reports about hospitals being at capacity, filling up, not being able to accept patients as is what's happening now again, you know? And we thought to ourselves as architects, what can we do? How can we help? And for us, really, we wanted to you know, be on the ground. We wanted to be frontliners, if you may. And you know, we always say that you know, architects are, are an essential part of our community. And how we do this is by providing and building you know, the shelter or the spaces that our community needs. So we came up with this idea of you know, using the technology or idea or methodology behind this structure and augmenting our hospitals um, you know because the formula is there this is something we could build in five days with 20 people with one architect on site to kind of like adapt it to the needs of the community and so immediately you can augment the capacity of each hospital and the idea was that it is something that is local um, when you're sick you want to be in a place that you're familiar with, or at least nearby. So you go to the local hospital. So how do we solve this problem when the hospital is full? We build structures that can be used immediately. So if you can imagine after five days, this is turned over the next day to the hospital and they can utilize it immediately. So, you know, it's really about, you know, emergency. And that's why it's an emergency facility. Um, it's being there on time, getting it when it's needed, um, and being able to do it without a lot of fuss, you know. And so it's really, the idea was it's something that is scalable and, and fast. The two things really we were looking after was speed and scalability. And so with the wood and the plastic, which are very forgiving materials, and 
you know, if you go around the Philippines in any island, you know, what you will find, you know, around the, even the trash heap Make really is plastic and wood, right? So plastic and wood you can find anywhere. Plastic and wood anyone understands. You can hammer it with a nail, you can, you, you can staple it with a gun, you can tape it together if you want. It is something that any community can build. And so this was something that can be built throughout our archipelago, especially during times when logistics are very, very challenging. Uh, I think, uh, just a quick backstory, uh, this was conceived or planned and made without uh, having COVID-19 yet. There was no COVID-19 at the time. And uh, there was. I mean, we it wasn't a problem yet yes. here. It was when we were thinking it was. Yeah, we were COVID supposed to get yeah. Martin and Han, right? Yeah. And we were supposed to get Jason. And I'm glad they're able World to join us this year, events. right? Um, yeah. It's but great. the designing yeah. phase, we didn't have, there was no COVID yet. So it's interesting how this was, we planned it to be all recyclable materials. We used uh, wood that wasn't, uh, you know, new. We used like spare wood and then on the plastic, even the plastic, we really looked for like. Yeah, the, 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 the title for the project was Snow Virgins, right? And so the idea was that we are using all recycled materials, right? So you know, we're upcycling uh, material. So it was recycled plastic, um, old Miralco posts, shipping pallets, exactly what we did and used for the quarantine facilities really. And so I think it was very apt, very timely. It was very apt. I feel like that encourages us to always, you know, just be on the ball all the time. Think about these ideas because you don't know when yeah. they'll have to adapt into something and, and, and more it useful. kind of fits you know this bayanihan culture that we have right if we all have these images i think every one of us grew up with textbooks where you have you know um people carrying, carrying the, houses. the houses building it on site you know um i think that's what we wanted to do we wanted something that you know um anyone can come together and build you know architecture that can be done by the local community um, architecture that is not about the complexity or complications of architecture, but rather the main goal of the project was how to make it as simple as possible, make it as understandable and digestible for you know everyone in the community. Let's talk about how that did evolve because what we did was we we sent out the plans. We just made them open source, and then local governments found it, hospitals found it, and then they started to build it, and then. That's how the community so, grew, and we also had all of these donations coming in. I, I, I think it was really great that, yeah. you know, um, and that's really why anthology is important. Um, I think the first thing we did was we reached out to the anthology community, we reached out to everyone, you know, all the architects, um, Denise, um, Jason, Benji, um, you know, um, basically like, um, we wanted, this is something that only architects for us can build. Because, you know, we have to be able to adapt the structure based on the site and space available to each hospital, right? So we had T-shaped structures, Y-shaped structures, J-shaped, whatever. Um, and so it's about the architect being on the ground, getting our hands dirty and being builders, right? It's about building and not just, you know, like they say, the architect, though, drawing lang lage. So I think for once we're showing, you know, what it means to have architects in our communities and why we're important. And Really, it's, you know, um, that this is the time when I actually appreciated, you know, um, all our sponsors from Anthology, you know, um, having a good and strong local building industry matters. Because during a pandemic or during a crisis, you cannot import things from China, mm -hmm. right? It is about the people who are here. They are the ones who matter, our suppliers, our vendors, you know, the whole industry, you know, our contractors, our builders. Um, I remember I was talking to some of the workers during the quarantine facilities and I was telling them like, you know, for the first time in your life, you're actually building something for the community and yourself, right? It is something that is immediately needed by all of us. You're not building for someone who's mayaman or someone who wants a house or a building or a skyscraper or a shopping mall. You're building something that the community really needs. And so I think it was also great seeing the workers understand this and trying to do their best also. And, you know, even I think we learned, you know, a lot from the construction workers, actually the laborers, about how to simplify, how to make the structure easier to build. Um, probably, you know, half the things, you know, about the facility was really from the workers themselves because they show us how to build it faster, how to make it easier. I think it was also kind of like an eye-opening experience to show that 
we architects don't know everything. Maybe probably nothing, right? Um, the important thing is, are the people on the ground who actually make things happen, who can actually get these things built? And it's vital, you know, that we have builders in each community because that's how you build a city. But yeah, like you said, it really shows the value of the people who are actually working on this. And I remember uh, seeing the photos, like, it's such a distinct and such a distinct silhouette that's very easy to identify, you know. And but the, but the cool thing is that we have so many variations of the EQF. We have like different materials coming in. We have, I think we had a steel frames. And it's just cool how this like form kept evolving. Yeah, I think, I think it's really, it's not about the structure or the space. It's about the idea behind it, about galvanizing the architecture community, you know, about how we can, how we can actually build hyper-local spaces that are available to everyone, right? Um, it's about how architects matter, what we can do. Um, it's about how architects can work together and collaborate. I think, you know, we all talk about collaboration, um, but I've never seen collaboration like um, how we were doing when we were building all these quarantine facilities. Um, shout out to the guys from the, you know, um, tech team, the advisory, the builders. Um, Arvin was one of the main builders. Um, Jeffrey is going to be here later. Um, you know, it's really the people on the ground who are willing to get their hands dirty. You know, it's about being willing to share ideas, to learn from each other, um, and being able to lead, you know. And I think that's how you, I think we always have this question about what architecture means and how we can differentiate an architect from engineers, is that, you know, architects can project, you know, we can project how things can be. Um, we are vital because we connect everyone together. We're connected to the builders, we're connected to the vendors, we're connected to the plumbing, the electrical, everything, right? So, you know, it's good to have a master builder. And we have to embrace this role as architects that we are master builders. I think that's what people don't see when they like, clamor for, um, like when they say that architects, uh, they have no, they, can't, they, can't. Oh, they have no value like that in the sense that I think a lot of us architects also forgot in this role that we really just tie these things together. And that's, that's what the city needs, that's what architecture needs more of. And yeah, in that sense. Okay, we'll have some Q&A in a couple minutes. But before that, I think we should dive into this project here, our master plan. This is another project that you were able to complete, I mean the master plan at least, during pandemic. Yeah, so I think this project, um, you know, during the pandemic or while building the quarantine facilities, um, we always had this um, line going on in all our groups with everyone. Um, we always said that it takes a village, you know, to build, right? Um, it also takes a city to build a city, you know? And so, you know, it was really, I think, very apt for us to kind of like come up with a way to reimagine how we wanted Metro Manila is. So I think this is the first time we're unveiling this scale model. Um, this is a miniature model of um, the Anthology Festival. Ah, sorry, of the Horizon Manila project. And so what we wanted to show here was um, we actually were tasked to master plan this 419 hectare uh, project. Um, this is a reclamation project um, along Manila Bay. So it's made of three main islands. And, you know, our idea really was, it's a case of tabula rasa, where you have a blank canvas, right? But, you know, as architects, we always like to work with landforms. And we said, if we cannot have an interesting geography, maybe we can build an interesting urbanity. And so we were thinking about how this can actually be like an urban valley you know, with that canal going through the middle. And so basically, I was reminded of how, you know, Manila was settled along the Pasig River. And I said, you know, how we can build a new city is maybe by building communities, you know, along an extension or, um, you know, um, a celebration of that lifestyle or that river, right? Manila is a city by the river and by the bay. And so is Horizon Manila. And so what we have here is we have these three islands connected by this canal park. 
So basically, what you have is you have this 50 hectare uh, parkscape right in the middle of the city, right? And so instead of having one major master plan, what we're trying to do here is we're building 28 different communities. And so we wanted to build something that can remind people of Manila, you know, and the character of Manila. And so this project was called Manilenio. And what makes Manila distinct and special from the rest of our cities is that you can actually walk from Quiapo to Raon, to Avenida, to Santo Cristo, to Binondo, you know, to San Nicolas and Visoria. I mean, there are all these different places that are distinct in the memory of people who live in Manila. And so what we're building here is um, we're building a gateway community here, for example. Then it slowly blends into this courtyard community. This is um, so this is the this is Manila. Um, this comes from Manila, right? So you're actually this is going towards the west, looking towards the bay. Um, so Manila is to the east. So when you first go in, there's this gateway community. The gateway community ties into this kind of like um, transportation hub that's connected by a monorail. Um, then beside it, you have this courtyard community, kind of like um, kind of like Recto and Avenida before, where you have like uh, maybe five, eight-story buildings around it. And then we're just inserting courtyards into each block here. And then, of course, you know, this kind of urbanity gives way to traders, you know. Um, so we were looking at a trading community centered around a driving range. And so this becomes your trading hub, right? Um, and then the trading hub is connected to this market area. So we have here the market, which anchors this space. And in front of that is the, that is the fairgrounds. Now, right beside that, kind of like as the heart of this first island is this village. So this becomes kind of like the catalyst for growth, right? The starter or the first settlement in the community. It's by the park along the river or canal. Um, beside it, you have the school, you have churches, uh, you have the church, um, you have the playground. Um, and also you have, you can extend your, you can walk all the way to the bay. Um, now beside this, you have the tech hub. It's here where we're gonna have like a tech school. And then we have fab shops, we can have fabrication labs, labs for like mass customization of the future. And then this becomes kind of like a design corridor. Uh, we're actually planning to build our office here as a starter level. And then this connects the innovation center with the cultural heart. Because this is an arts museum. The arts museum is built um, on an axis going towards um, Rizal Park. And it's right by this waterway. So the waterway is here, and beside the waterway, we actually have um, the theater district, which is here. You know, we want to kind of like revive this idea of having independent cinemas and theaters like we used to have in Recto, you know, or even having something like Broadway here in this area by the river. Um, and then beside us, you have that kind of like the tourist district. Um, so this is where the cruise ship will be coming in. This is the convention center. Um, you have your gaming centers here. And then beside that is basically the park district. Um, these are the residences around the park. So this is the kind of like the widest stretch of park area. And so around this, you have the higher density residences. Um, beside this, um, you have the affordable housing community. Um, so if you can see, it's a bit denser. And the idea is that, you know, you need affordable housing <clears throat> to provide services for the whole city. Um, to the south, um, here you actually have kind of like um, independent living campus. Um, so you have your major hospital here. Um, you have, you know, um, housing for the seniors and then people who care for them. Um, and then here in this area, basically what we have is we have the zoo here and the botanical garden. Um, and then this walkway actually is kind of like the fashion walk. Uh, so we will have light retail along this strip. And you can actually walk and cross towards here, which is kind of like the, the high luxury high street. Yeah, this is the high street. So this acts like uptown, where you have your two major hotels. And then here you have your stadium. Um, so beside the stadium, we have a street ball park, a basketball park. We actually have two of them. We wanted to revive the idea of street ball culture. And so one is here and another one here. You actually have eight courts here and 24 here, right? 24 courts here. And so the idea is that after work, you know, the people from the market, from the trading district, they can go play basketball. 
same with this area because this becomes our CBD area. So this area is our CBD area. And from here, the basketball courts are accessible. You can go to this waterway and have a nice view of the um, sunset and everything. You can walk from one end of the island towards the other end. So the canal park has a parallel pedestrian walk also. So if you want to walk by the park and enjoy a leisurely walk towards the edge, you can. If you want, you know, faster pedestrian walkway, you have, and you see all these pedestrian bridges. Basically, we're building a city of bridges here, and you can see there's, there are innumerable bridges all over here, and that will be kind of like the character that develops in this community. Now, this will be the main shopping area here, and then this will be the kind of like the Sunset District, um, your uptown residences, if you may, and you have the, the Yacht Harbor here, and then you have kind of like um, house, houseboats parked over here and you have waterside residences with the uh, water sports facilities being here. Now, the important thing about having all this fresh water in this city is that we're kind of like trying to be, build a city that will be self-sustaining. Um, so we have all these water reservoirs and the idea is that um, all these reservoirs will not just make Horizon self-sustaining but also be able to actually contribute back to the city. I think the main challenge of our future in terms of sustainability will be water scarcity. And so we're trying to address that here. We're trying to, there are gonna be the salination and purification plants um, here. And then this will serve as a reservoir, not just for Horizon, but for the rest of Manila. That's excellent. Um, now that we've, Kind of talked about what Horizon is. Um, can you take us back to your your process or like how you thought about it in your head? Because um, I remember when we were doing the project, uh, we started off with like a grand gesture, and also we kind of zoomed in and out constantly, going into the sidewalks, the communities, all these small things, and then suddenly zooming back out and then like looking at it as a scale model, if it works as a if like yeah like. The, if, it, if their heights are right, if everything is good as a, a macro level. So. I, I think with any project, what we endeavor to do is there is this consistency of thought um, throughout the project. Like whether you're looking at the detail or the macro level, that the message you're trying to convey should be consistent. So in terms of this project, it was about diversity. It was about creating you know, a more varied urban landscape. Um, so you will see that there is a great sense of hierarchy in terms of how the buildings, you know, are clustered together. And that was really the main idea that we want to build different communities. You know, we want to kind of like, so in terms of like social architecture, it was really the idea that you're not looking at a top-down master plan, right? You do not dictate everything, but rather building, you know, the spaces that will allow for more organic growth, you know, in each community. So I think to an extent, that's also letting go of a bit of control. Like Sorry? We, we're letting go of a bit of control there. Like we don't dictate so much, but we allow things to happen. Yeah, I think, you know, in any master plan, you know, any master plan ends the moment things start to happen, right? So it's really about providing guide rails of some sort in terms of like how the city will develop and grow. And that's the main goal here. Okay, at this time, we'll answer some Q&A questions. Okay, the first question for you. Is it possible to build a socially intimate space while following the social distancing of anti-COVID protocol? This is a very timely question, but... Yeah, I think one of the things that we wanted to move towards after building the facilities was like, we were saying, you know, it's good and well if you can quarantine in your, in your, in your home, right? But not everyone has a big enough home where you can stay in. The reality is that some of us have to take, you know, some neighborhoods here, you have to take turns sleeping, you know, because you don't have enough space for everyone in the family. And so we were saying that we must make, we must, we must build or strengthen local community bubbles, right? Um, so you, have, you build local bubbles where everything is available and accessible. You encourage more public space. You, you convert the streets into a park. Yeah, because some of these small streets here are not necessary for, you know, um, so if you can make them pedestrian, if they can be somewhere people can actually hang out in, 
instead of like if you go through some of our neighborhoods, you see people you know squeezed in on the sidewalks, right? And there's just no way for you to get them off the sidewalk because there's nowhere for them to go. So instead of just having these like two one meter wide sidewalks, can we get the eight meter wide street and turn it into a local community park? And so I mean, but that's just the idea behind strengthening local communities. You want to make community bubbles where everyone can just stay there instead of going, traveling somewhere to, I don't know, um, go to a shopping mall or, you know, um, buy groceries somewhere. Um, if they can have everything accessible locally, then you're lessening the spread, you know, or the risk of having, you know, this contagion spread more and more throughout the city. So it's a little, like, it's a little weird to think about how making these parks and open spaces for people actually helps to mitigate the spread. Yeah, because you're, 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 you're making, you're containing people, right? Um, you're passively containing people and encouraging them to be, to stay in their own communities. Um, actually, going back to like the big scale questions, um, how do you think this affects uh, Manila? How do you think this affects um, Manila and all its problems of over overpopulation and traffic and all these things? Um, so Manila is the densest city in the world right now, right? and we really need more space. For example, this increases the space that you find in Rizal Park by 50%. Um, just this canal park in the middle. If you total all the parks or the open spaces here, you're basically doubling the available open space in Manila right now. And so I think, you know, we really need to figure out a way to address this by not getting people to travel from Cavite, from Rizal, from Bulacan, just to work in Metro Manila. We need more space to accommodate more people at the core of our city, right? So every car ride that you remove I think is you know a big plus for the environment. Mm. So that kind of I guess it links into how you have the Clark Smart City being built, and so this project is a reclamation be be beside Manila. So in terms of master planning, urban planning, do you think that those are ideas that contrast to each other? Do they contradict or? I think Manila? you know every drop counts. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of like whether give, we give up on our city or not, I'm not ready to do so. Um, so I think, you know, um, we must find ways to make our city more livable. Um, yes, decongesting Manila is a goal of this government. But at the end of the day, the reality is that, you know, throughout the history of mankind, cities continue to grow. They don't shrink. Uh, more and more of us will be living in urban conditions. And we just have to figure out a way to how we can alleviate this density. Um, our next question is from Arkinisha. Um, so they're asking, well, what difficulties often occur when you were designing the social architecture projects? Sorry, again. What difficulties often occur when you're designing social architecture projects? I, I think the pushback, the pushback from the community, um, how do you get communities to accept this more? Um, we actually encountered this after we built the emergency quarantine facilities. We wanted to move towards community street parks. But then, you know, um, the, the thing is, a lot of our um, policy makers um, do not yet grasp or understand the benefits, you know, um, of public space. Um, I think it's about, and so it's not just about public space, but about a lot of urban amenities and situations, I think. That's why we have to have platforms like Anthology to create more awareness because, you know, it's really about convincing people, right? So if each and every one of you can be an advocate, you know, um, I think if you can talk to 10 people who are not architects, then, you know, it just multiplies the amount of ideas floating out there about how we can make our cities work. Um, okay, let's talk about in Horizon, street scale level for this development. How much did you contextualize the Philippines here? Is it in the Filipino context, or this build this project is is it globalization at its heart? Well, so what is a what is Filipino, right? That's always the question, and so I always like to think about Manila first because I grew up in Manila. So what is Manila? Manila is a city by the river and by the bay, right? It's a city with all the canals, you know, all the esteros that we have. And so for me, this is an opportunity to do so, right? So the urbanity or the 
the geography is there. Um, what else? Um, it's all about the communities, about the different, the diversity. You know, that's what makes Manila great, really. Um, it's not the buildings. Um, we have, you know, uh, we showed the skyline earlier, but it's not about the skyline or about the buildings around us. But, you know, it's about the streetscape and how they can vary. Um, so if you look at this project, a lot of it, a lot of the taller buildings are actually more clustered and than what you would see in uh, Western planning or the urban planning models out there. But, you know, for me, the reality is that you want to create more shaded areas. We do not want wide avenues or boulevards. We want to have shaded streets with wide sidewalks. And that's really what we're trying to build here in the context of our climate. Okay, uh, our next question is from Pahe. Um, I think we've, we've kind of touched on this, but just generally. Um, the question is, the reimagined community city is great, but how about the existing settlement problems in Metro Manila, especially in informal settlements? How will social architecture address the suggest solutions to provide opportunity to your urban poor, improve the current situation and not just remove it? Um, the, I think the, the problem with the settlement problems in Manila, I think, is brought about by density, firstly. And so the inaccessibility to a lot of services, right? So if you have people who cannot afford better living conditions or better homes for themselves, maybe we at least should provide the public infrastructure to allow them to do so, right? Uh, for example, if they can have access to libraries, they can learn. If they can ac have access to creative spaces like museums and design centers, then they can be more creative, especially in you know, with all the, you know, Instagram uh, pages we have, with the makers we have. Um, I think there's so many ways um, to empower people. But first and foremost, I think you have to have the urban amenities in place that will allow you to uplift them. Um, but of course, for example, like in Horizon Manila, we have um, actually about 20% uh, of the site goes to government. And as I mentioned, there are spaces allocated for public housing, for government infrastructure. And that's really vital in terms of how we develop our city. So for example, in these three islands, each island will have space um, for public housing. And so it's about you know, showing you know, our policymakers that you know, public housing matters. That that is the, one of the most vital things we can actually do to solve the traffic problem is by making people live where they work. We have a question from Nikolai Go of Fabtech. Oh, sorry, Nikolai David of Fabtech. Hi, William. What made you decide on hard edges or the man-made edges versus our soft natural edges for this master plan? Well, when you're building a reclamation project, you really, it's actually not a very hard edge. Um, so if you look at this project, um, this is a massing model, so it doesn't show. But throughout the edge of this island or these three islands, you actually have mangroves. Um, maybe you guys should go check out the video on Nikolai Hai. Um, maybe Nick, check out the video on YouTube um, of Port Horizon and you'll see how the edges are built. And the three islands are surrounded by mangroves, actually. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have another question here. How do you intend the project to be sustainable, considering its location, how... Oh, marine biodiversity. So I think there are different ways of looking at sustainability, right? Um, most people think about sustainable materials, which is well and good. I think sustainability is about urbanity and density, you know, um, about lessening travel from work to home. So it's about creating space inside our city for people. You know, you can build the most sustainable house in the world, but if you're occupying 500 square meters for three people, you're never gonna be sustainable. Because that same 500 square meters can house what? A hundred people. So I think it's really about trying to make density work. That's really my first goal. Um, lessening travel time, letting people live in the center of our city. Um, you cannot have two million people traveling to Manila and outside every morning and every afternoon. That's why we have our traffic problems, right? So we have to keep trying to lessen this demand on our infrastructure. And so every single, like I said, every single trip you remove, um, every house you can provide in city versus outside the city is a win. You're talking about 1% of the bay here, right, for reclamation. I mean, the bay is huge. 
And honestly, well, these areas, firstly, there's no di marine diversity, biodiversity here because it's been, it's filled up with sludge right now. And so, you know, actually, if you look, look at the map, look at the map, Manila Bay is bigger than Metro Manila. And so you can actually check out what four hectare, 400 hectares actually means um, and how big a space we're occupying. In scale, I think the size is about the same as the UP Diliman property. Yeah. 420 hectares or so. That's a big scale. We have another question here from Facebook. Um, from Melvin? Melvin Miguel. So we're saying climate change is staring at us up front. And um, I think the more, the more important question here is that um, how are we addressing the rise of the sea level given its reclamation project? Physically, this project is actually higher than the current level of Manila. Um, if you're talking about typhoons, typhoons actually come from the east. That's why Manila is where it is. If you look at the map of our region, that's why the eastern side of the Sierra Madres are empty. Right? So the typhoons do not, do not come from the west, they come from the east. Uh, next, I think the idea like um, we're trying to provide fresh water which is what we need. Um, we haven't built a dam in I don't know how long for the city. And you know, we've all been experiencing water shortage as really a major problem, despite you know, our city being blessed with you know, the climate we have with the regular rainfall. And so it's always about collecting rainwater. Um, secondly, Horizon Manila will have a green plot ratio of one, meaning we'll have 419 hectares of green space. Um, so you're actually increasing green spaces for wildlife or birds. Um, that's why you can actually cross these three islands from one end to the other, um, walking in parks. And so if you look at the streetscape, um, maybe if you can find the street sections and all that, all the streets are tree-lined. Um, it's about having these like crossings for all the wildlife also. And our last question for the sessions. Oh, it comes back to our pedestrian bridge earlier. It says, how will the bridge be pedestrian friendly only and not let any other vehicles, such as motorcycles, I think, be able to use it? How is that going to be safe from crime? And how will it be safe for the street vendors? Um, I, th I think the question actually, they didn't understand that the street vendors are allowed on the bridge. But So I'm not gonna make any place safe from street vendors mm -hmm. i think they're what makes our streets come alive yeah you know um at the end of the day we just have to find we just have to kind of like alleviate this struggle between pedestrians and vendors maybe and actually for me what you remove are the cars and vehicles so you retain the vendors you retain the pedestrians um cars have no way of going up the bridge because you need to go upstairs and cars will not fit it's a pedestrian bridge um, you cannot get a car up on a pedestrian bridge um, unless, I don't know, <laughs> it's, a it, it's a pedestrian bridge. <laughs> At least the cars cannot go upstairs. Yeah. Um, yeah, so thanks for that. Okay, um, before we close out our session with you, um, maybe you can give us some final thoughts on, I guess, working on the master plan. You're an architect primarily, but the fact that you had this opportunity to work on this master plan of this scale, Tell us about the importance of it for our city and in the future for architecture for you. I, I think the scale of what we do is not dictated by our profession. Um, I think architects are creative individuals. We paint, we draw, we sketch, we make things. Um, you know, it, it's really about the thinking, you know, about how you want to build something um, better, right? And for us really, you know, the opportunity to plan such a big part of our city, you know, um, we only have one goal, basically. We, we just want to build a better tomorrow for everyone. And that's really what matters for us. Um, there's no main agenda besides that. Um, and, you know, we're blessed to be working with people who are actually understanding of that, that they do actually want to build a better city. And so I, for me, it's a great opportunity, really. Um, and it's something I've been embracing and looking forward to. I think we're all looking forward to this development coming in. Soon. Fruition. Soon. Uh -huh. <laughs> Soon, yeah. Timeline. It's going to start this year. Yeah, the timeline is closing in on us. All right. So 
Very good. Let's just thank you, William, for joining us. Thank you, and everyone, for asking questions, by the way. Thank you for joining us in the questions. And join us again tomorrow. We will be speaking with Jason Buensalido. He will be speaking about Casa Uccello. And we'll also be talking to international professors where they'll talk about architecture, teaching architecture in the time of pandemic. And so thanks, everyone, for coming out. Enjoy anthology! <laughs> <laughs>